in the majestic yet ominous court of the dying Sultan Murad IV. A chilling decree echoes through the room. The death sentence for his own brother, Ibrahim. But fate, in the form of their formidable mother, Kosum Sultan, intervenes, preserving one life and perhaps unwittingly setting an empire on the path to decline. Why would Murad demand his brother's death, knowingly ending his family's dynasty? How did Sultan Ibrahim's reign contribute to the Ottoman Empire's downturn? And what happens when one grows up shackled not by iron, but by golden bars of royalty and fear? Today we will answer each of those questions as we go over the events that would create one of history's most deranged rulers, who would end up beginning the fall of the great Ottoman Empire. So for a little pretext before we begin today's episode, I've been told that I should give some fair warning that this show is very explicit and the humor can be a little crude and dark. So if any of you have an issue with me saying the following words, shit, fuck, fucking fuck, damn, ass, gummy wummies, or Jerry, then you may have some issues listening to this episode. Now that that's out of the way, let's begin by briefly going over how the Ottoman Empire came into being, and then get into the sultans before Ibrahim and Murad that would push the snowball from the top of the mountain that would turn into an avalanche of issues they would try to overcome. The rise of the Ottoman Empire can be traced back to the late 13th century, starting with a small Anatolian Beylik, or principality, and growing into one of the world's most powerful states by the 16th century. The Ottoman Empire was founded around 1299 by Osman I, a leader of a tribe in western Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey. The region was fragmented following the decline and fragmentation of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. Osman I took advantage of this power vacuum and began to expand his territory, initially towards Byzantine lands. Osman's son, Orhan, captured the city of Bursa in 1326 and made it the new capital of the Ottoman state. The conquest of Thrace, which started under Orhan and continued under his successors, brought the Ottomans to the doorstep of Constantinople, the the Byzantine capital. The Ottomans began to absorb other Turkish states and also extended their control over the Balkans. The Ottoman Empire's major rise to power occurred in the 15th century in 1453 under the rule of Mehmed the Conqueror. The Ottomans captured Constantinople, marking the end of the Byzantine Empire. This monumental event cemented the Ottomans' power and made them a dominant force in the region that no one really wanted to fuck with because of how brutal they were to the nobility and commoners in Constantinople. It was said they would put on a gladiatorial-style show where they would force families to kill each other, promising them that the last one standing would be allowed to flee and live. After the winners killed their family members, they would then be placed into a room where they would wait before being released and then given a champion's feast which consisted of a dolma and sarma and rice. Uh, then the filling of the sarma was shredded meat. And if they asked for seconds, or once they were finished eating, they'd bring in the meat bucket they used, which would contain the hen- heads of their recently slaughtered family members, causing them to have a psychotic break where they would begin shitting themselves and flinging it around the walls of the room. Um, and then they would stay in that room until they would die of dehydration. <laughs> if, if you bought that, that's no, uh, no, I'm sorry. I, that's the first little fake out, but, uh, they, uh, the Ottomans were actually very surprisingly tolerant to the nobility and commoners. And instead of, uh, instead of killing them, they chose to ransom the majority of them and only killed people if they fought back after being captured and didn't do the sick and twisted shit that I just described. 
that I probably need to go talk to a therapist about since that was a, that was a little too easy to think of. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent from 1520 to 1566 marked the peak of Ottoman power. Suleiman expanded the empire into the southeast Europe, including Hungary and parts of the Middle East, including Egypt and much of the Arabian Penins- Peninsula. The empire was also a major naval power, controlling key maritime trade routes, uh, including parts of the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Mediterranean. So in summary, uh, the rise of the Ottoman Empire was a gradual process, built on strategic military conquests and shrewd political maneuvering. They exploited the weakness of their neighbors and capitalized on key geographic locations to control trade routes. And by the 16th century, the empire had grown from a small Anatolian principality to a vast empire, covering parts of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So with that out of the way, let's take a dive into the feuds and the rulers that would eventually lead into Ibrahim the Mad taking over and absolutely wrecking the empire's future. Let's begin with Ahmed I, who was Ibrahim's father. Ahmed ascended the throne after his father's death in 1603, at the age of 13, when his powerful grandmother, Safiye Sultan, was still alive. With his ascension to the throne, the power struggle in the harem flared up, because his grandma and mom would fight to gain more power and influence. Eventually, Ahmed decided he maybe cared more about his mom and banished his grandma, because, you know, mom mom is just a little more important than you, grandma, so suck it. (laughs) But uh, Ahmed's uncle Yahya... Uh, resented his ascension to the throne and spent his life scheming to become sultan. Ahmed broke with the traditional fratricide following previous enthronements and did not order the execution of his brother Mustafa. Which, by the way, the the fratricides were pretty fucking wild. Um, And the way that they would do successions was crazy. So here, here is how they would typically go down. From the 14th through the late 16th centuries, the Ottomans practiced open succession, which was essentially a survival of the fittest scenario. It really did not matter if you were the fucking eldest or not for a while. (laughs) During their father's lifetime, all adult sons of the reigning um, Ottoman family, uh, family sultan, were given uh, provincial governorships in order to gain experience in administration um, which was a practice that's actually very common in Central Asian tradition. Uh, and they were accompanied and mentored by their two, uh, retinues, uh, ret- <laughs> retinues and tutors. And upon the death of their father, the reigning sultan, those, these sons would fight amongst themselves for the succession until one emerged triumphant. Their fights were very similar to the hit 1998 show Celebrity Deathmatch and was the main entertainment for commoners. They had open gambling circuits on who would be the first to become sultan and then the last one to be <laughs> sultan as uh, just because you were first did not guarantee you were sultan for that long. And since the latter would take years, uh, they would allow for pools to be placed on each of the former sultan's sons and as soon as one of them would die, the money pot on that kid would be evenly dispersed between the remaining sons. This would lead to many of the commoners teaming up with the son they bet on, and they would participate in battles with them to kill the other sons. <laughs> Which would be... It's kind of the truth. Uh, while, while the gambling aspect of it may not be entirely true uh, with the commoners, many of the nobility would bank on one or two of the sons being enthroned and make power moves to move themselves up in the hierarchy of the empire and would manipulate things behind the scenes all the time. The most common manipulators were the grand viziers, uh, viziers, and also the mothers of the sons, uh, as the sultans would typically have a harem, or uh, many concubines, and whichever concubine's son became the the sultan, they would gain the title, uh, a very coveted and uh, very influential title in the hierarchy of Vildali Sultan or Mother of the Sultan, uh, which is very, very important and gives them quite a bit of power, as you'll you'll see later on. 
Uh, but this would lead to them um, doing some nasty backstabbing and possibly sleeping around to get their son the support they'd need to become the sultan. Typically, the first son to reach the capital and seize control of the court would usually become the new ruler. The proximity of a cesad or prince, to Constantinople, improved his chances of success, simply because he could hear of his father's death, seize control of the Ottoman court in the capital, and declare himself sultan first. A sultan could thus hint at his preferred successor by giving a favorite son a closer governorship. Occasionally, the half-brothers would begin the struggle even before the death of their father. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, strife between his sons Mustafa and Selim caused such internal turmoil that Solomon ordered the deaths of both Mustafa and another son, uh, Bayezid, leaving Selim the sole heir. Which, oh man, could you imagine having to just like pick one of your kids and like you had to kill the other ones just to stop the fighting? Oh, I bet that broke his heart. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe he didn't give a shit. He was like, ah, I like this one the most. During the reigns of Suleiman I and Selim II, the Haseki Sultan, or chief consort, rose to greater prominence, gaining power within the imperial harem. The favorite was able to maneuver to ensure the succession for one of her sons. This led to a short period of the eldest son just having the claim to the throne. However, when the Sultan had already defeated his brothers and potential rivals for the throne in battle, these Sultans had the problem of many half-brothers who could act as the focus for rival factions. Thus, to prevent attempts at seizing the throne, reigning sultans practiced frat- fratricide upon ascension, starting with Murad I in 1362. Both Murad III and his son Mohammed III had their half-brothers murdered. The killing of all the new sultans' brothers and half-brothers, who were usually quite numerous because sul- these sultans like just fucked like rabbits, was traditionally done by manual strangling with a silk cord. Which, hey, I mean, if you gotta, you gotta strangle someone, might as well do it with silk. <laughs> and fun side note, uh, it, is, it is thought that the first documented case of erotic asphyxiation was actually one of the princes of the Ottoman Empire, who is reported to have become erect while being choked and ejaculated during it. Um, it wouldn't be further noted upon until the late 1600s where observers at hangings would notice that men would get hard and come during it. Which, I mean, talk about a splash zone. Am I right? Like, God, could you imagine being at a hanging and you just push on your face? Oh, gross. But they're dead, so, you know. Um, yeah, I, I do not envy whoever had to clean that up. Uh, doctors would go on to note that it was uh, so common that for every three people hanged, at least one would get an erection and come. Uh, it was also noted that women would become aroused as well. Uh, so, you know, that's, yeah, that's pretty cool shit. <laughs> Anyways, as the centuries passed, the ritual killing was gradually replaced by lifetime solitary confinement in the golden cage or kafis, uh, a room in the harem from where the sultan's brother could never escape unless they became heir presumptive. Mohammed III was the last sultan to have previously held a provincial governorship. Sons now remained within the harem until the death of their father. This not only denied them the ability to form powerful faction, factions capable of usurping their father, but also denied them the opportunity to have children while their father remained alive. And imagine growing up in a family so crippled by fear, you couldn't trust your own children not to kill you. <laughs> and you know what? Actually, I um, I kind of do get it. You know, my my two year old will just stare at me sometimes and say shit that has me convinced he's he's plotting a hostile takeover. Like, oh hi dad, which is obviously a reference to the two thousand three movie The Room. But instead of Mark, he chose Dad just to throw me off and hinting he plans on offing me like how Johnny offs himself at the end of the film, possibly. Also, whenever I wake up, he's usually awake first and is just laying on me, lapping or faking sleep. And I used to think he was just trying to cuddle me closer and show affection to me by hugging me. But after reading this, I know he's been trying to strangle me. He 
isn't trying to give me a hug. He's feigning affection, so I let my guard down so he can send me to an internal rest. I fucking know he is, and I'm not crazy. When Mohammed's son came to the throne as Ahmed I, he had no children of his own. Moreover, <laughs> as a minor, there was no evidence he could have children. This had the potential to create a crisis of succession and led to a gradual end to fratricide, which would ca also cause many in the palace to think of and find new ways to consolidate power that they could become that could become a threat to the sultans. So instead of visiting Allah at the hands of a janissary with some silk, uh, Mustafa was sent to live at the old palace at the Bayezid, uh, along with their grandmother, Safiye Sultan. This was most likely due to Ahmed's young age. He had not yet demonstrated his ability to, to sire children. And Mustafa, uh, blah, 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 blah. and Mustafa was then the only other candidate for the Ottoman throne. His brother's execution would have endangered the dynasty and is really the only reason he didn't get the golden garret, uh, garot treatment that his other brothers got. Ahmed's mother tried to interfere in his affairs and influence his, his decision because she wanted to control his communication and movements, probably to show other schemers the sultan was her, pu pu her puppet and not anyone else's. In the earlier part of Ahmed's rule, he showed decision and vigor, which were not indica indicative by the way he would conduct himself since he was a fucking 13-year-old child. <laughs> the wars in Hungary and Persia, which attended his ascension, terminated unfavorably for the empire. Its prestige was further tarnished by the Treaty of Zisvatorok, signed in 1606 when Ahmed was 16 whereby the annual tribute paid by Austria was abolished. Following the crushing, crushing defeat in the Ottoman Safa, Safavid War against the neighboring rivals, the Safa, Safavid Empire, led by Shah Abbas the Great, and so Georgia, Azerbaijan, and other vast territories in the Caucasus, uh, were ceded back to Persia via the Treaty of Nasrul Pasha in 1612, territories that had been temporarily conquered in the Ottoman Safavid War. And the other war wars they had to go through were the wars with the uh, Habsburgs. The long Turkish war between the Ottomans and the Habsburg monarchy had been going on for over a decade by the time Ahmed ascended the throne. Grand Vizier Malkosh Ali Pasha marched to the Western Front from Constantinople on June 3rd, 1604, and arrived in Belgrade, but died there. So, the absolute legend, Mehmed Pasha, uh, Mehmed Pasha, was appointed as the Grand Vizier and the commander of the Western Army. Under Mehmed Pasha, the Western Army recaptured Pest and Vash, but failed to capture as... Um, as Tergom, as the siege was lifted due to unfavorable weather and the objections of the soldiers, because they were whiny and their feet hurt. Meanwhile, the Prince of Transylvania, Stephen Boxke, uh, who struggled for the region's independence and had formerly supported the Habsburgs, sent a messenger to the Porte asking for help. Upon the promise of help, his forces also joined the Ottoman forces in Belgrade. With this help, the Ottoman army besieged the Estergom and captured it on the 4th of November, 1605. Buxkai, with Ottoman help, captured Nove Zemki, uh, and forces under Tiraki Hassan Pasha took uh, Visprem and Palota. Sarhosh Ibrahim Pasha, the Belerpe of um, Nagriskanza, which uh, Belerpe is essentially like a commander, attacked the Austrian region of Istria. However, with the uh, Jalali revolts in Anatolia more dangerous than ever and a defeat in the Eastern Front, Mehmed Pasha was called to Constantinople, and this absolute legend of Mehmed Pasha suddenly died there whilst preparing to leave for the East, which fucking sucks because he was kicking all of the ass and taking names, but sadly... This is real life, and shit like dying suddenly would happen. So, 
Kyuku Murad Pasha then paid by Austria and addressed, oh, then negotiated the peace of Zivrstorok, which abolished the tribute of 30,000 ducats paid by Austria and addressed the and addressed the Hab- Habsburg emperor as equal of the Ottoman sultan. And the Jalali revolts were a strong factor in the Ottomans' acceptance of the terms. This signaled the end of Ottoman growth in Europe and proved that the sultanate was weakening. So let's go ahead and talk about the Jalali revolts a little bit because it's very important to understand context later on as to why many viewed the sultans as weak and why a lot of the reforms had to take place during Murad's reign. Resentment over the war with the Habsburgs and heavy taxation, along with the weakness of the Ottoman military response, combined to make the reign of Ahmed I the zenith of the Jalali revolt. Tavil Ahmed launched a revolt soon after the coronation of Ahmed I and defeated Nasuh Pasha and the Belar Bey of Anatolia, or like military commander, of Anatolia, uh, uh, Kedekhan Ali Pasha. Meanwhile, oh my god, they make these names so fucking difficult. Khan Bula Togulu Ali Pasha united his forces with Drus Sheik, and they all had the same fucking last name. It's There's so many Ali Pashas that it's like you want to refer them refer to them by their first name, but their first names are Im- impossible for me to pronounce. I've, I've learned a couple languages, and holy shit, that is difficult. That be, being as a, a, I've learned a couple languages, they're Latin-based, or love languages, so it, you know, doesn't really affect over here, where it's just so many different, like, vocal sounds. Anyways. Okay. United his forces with the Druze Sheikh Man, Manuglu Fekhedin to defeat the Amir of Tripoli, Sefugulu, Yusuf. You guys look up those names and pronounce it if you want, because I can't. I tried. I looked up pronunciation, guys, for a lot of this. Nope, I'm not remembering all of it. I tried. I can't. I don't have the time. He went on to take control of the Adana area, forming an army and issuing coins. His forces routed the army of the newly appointed commander, or I guess also like kind of like a governor of Aleppo, Hussein Pasha. Grand Vizier Boshnak Dervish Mehmed Pasha was executed for the weakness he showed against the Jalalis. Or Jalalis? Yeah, it's whatever. He was replaced by uh, Kuyu- Kuyuku Murad Pasha, who marched to Syria with his forces to defeat the 30,000 strong rebel army with great difficulty. On October 24th of 1607, meanwhile, he pretended to forgive the rebels in Anatolia and appointed the rebel Kalender Golu, who was active in Manisa and Bursa as the military leader of Ankara. This would come back to bite him in the ass later. Baghdad was recaptured in 1607 as well. Kambulu Togulu Ali Pasha fled to Constantinople asking for forgiveness from Ahmed I, who did forgive him. He appointed him to uh, Timisora and later Belgrade. Uh, but then executed him due to his misrule there. Which, to be fair, he did give this man three fucking chances, which is, you know, pretty goddamn fair, in my opinion, <laughs> especially for back then. Meanwhile, Kalin de Golu was not allowed in the city by the people of Ankara and rebelled again, only to be crushed by Murad Pasha's forces. Kalin de Golu ended up fleeing to Persia, Murad Pasha then suppressed some smaller revolts in central Anatolia and suppressed other Jalali chiefs by inviting them to join the army. Due to the widespread violence of the Jalali revolt, a great number of people had fled their villages and a lot of of villages were destroyed. Some military chiefs had claimed these abandoned villages as their property. This deprived the port the Porte of Tax Income, and on the 30th of September of 1609, Ahmed I issued a letter guaranteeing the rights of the villagers, uh, which promptly pissed off a lot of military leaders and caused them to think that the Sultanate didn't have uh, the best outlook for them. Uh, he then worked on the resettlement of abandoned villages, uh, really showed how far the Sultanate had fallen and how their authority was beginning to be easily challenged. 
The new Grand Vizier, Nashur Pasha, did not want to fight uh, with the Safavids. The Safavid Shah also sent a letter saying that he was willing to sign a peace treaty with which he would have to send 200 loads of silk every year to Constantinople with a note attached saying, uh, just in case this uh, kafis slash not killing your brother thing doesn't work out, with love, your boy, Safavid Shah. <laughs> oh man, I wish that note was there. Like, <laughs> like you just sent that to be sassy. But on the 20th of November, 1612, the Treaty of Nasuk Pasha was signed, which ceded all the lands to... Um, which ceded all the lands the Ottoman Empire had gained in the War of 1578-90 to 90 back to Persia and reinstated the 1,555 boundaries. However, the peace ended in 1615, not even three years later, when Shah did not send the 200 loads of silk, uh, probably because uh, Ahmed really didn't want to kill his brother. And he's like, well, why do you need the silk then? You're not going to be <laughs> garroting him with it. So on the 22nd of May, 1615, Grand Vizier Okus Mehmed Pasha was assigned to organize an attack on Persia. Mehmed Pasha delayed the attack till the next year until the Safavids made their preparations and attacked Ganja. In April of 1616, Mehmed Pasha left Aleppo with a large army and marched to Yerevan, where he failed to take the city and withdrew to Azizram. He was removed from his post and replaced by Damat Halil, Halil Pasha. Halil Pasha went for win- the winter to Diyarbakir, while the Khan of Crimea, Kanebek Giray, attacked the areas of Ganja. Uh, and Nakhitshevan and Julfa. During his reign, Ahmed would sire 13 sons and had all of them live in Topkapi uh, Palace because it was, uh, it was a fun place and there was a harem available for them of at least 300 women uh, where, who they couldn't fuck at all. Uh, but it does make me think like they, they each had to get assigned a certain amount of girls just in case, you know, uh, Ahmed bit the dust uh, so then they could, you know, start fucking. And the one that had 24 women... Uh, probably, you know, was uh, the favorite son and therefore would tr- become the next sultan. <laughs> so, uh, no, not really. It was, it was going to be the eldest. Um, anyways, after many battles, Ahmed would go on to construct the Ahmed Mosque and write a bunch of poetry before snuffing it. <laughs> so Ahmed I died of typhus and gastric bleeding on the 22nd of November, 1617 at the Topkapi Palace, Istanbul. He was buried in the Ahmed the First Mausoleum, or the Ahmed Mosque that I had mentioned earlier that he had had constructed. So Ahmed's death created a dilemma never before experienced by the Ottoman Empire. Multiple princes were now eligible for the Sultanate, and all of them lived in Topkapi Palace, a court faction headed by Selih, uh, Islam, Oh my God, Selhul Islam, Hassad Effendi and Sofu Mehmed Pasha decided to enthrone Mustafa instead of Ahmed's son, Osman. Sofu uh, Mehmed argued that Osman was too young to be enthroned without pissing a bunch of people off. <laughs> Which is fair, because the kid was pretty young, but also Ahmed took over at like 13, so who really gives a shit? You all know it's the Grand Vizier that's running the show, or the mom. <laughs> so the chief eunuch, Mustafa Aga objected, citing Mustafa's mental problems. But he was overruled, and so Mustafa's rise created uh, a new succession of principle, of seniority, that would last until the end of the empire. It was the first time an Ottoman sultan was succeeded by his brother instead of his son. His mother, Halime Sultan, became the uh, Valide Sultan, as well as regent and wielded great power. Due to Mustafa's mental condition, she acted as regent and exercised power more directly. So she took control. She was the one essentially acting as sultan for him. It was hoped that regular social contact would improve Mustafa's mental health, but his behavior remained eccentric. He pulled off the turbans of his viziers and yanked their beards. Uh, Others observed him throwing coins to birds and fish. The Ottoman historian Ibrahim um, Viv... Pevechi, or Peshevi, wrote, This situation was seen by all men of state and the people, 
and they understood that he was mentally disturbed. Really, to me, though, it just seems like he liked fucking around with people and was bored out of his mind since his mom was running shit for him, basically. Um, and because his mom was running shit, uh, it, it caused uh, a lot of, like, intricate port, uh, court uh, dynamics to happen. And he and Mustafa really was never more than a tool of the court uh, cliques at the to- Topkapi Palace. And so in 1618, after a short rule, another palace faction deposed him in favor of his young uh, nephew, Osman II, um, probably because Qasem Sultan really wanted to be in charge and wanted to take power away from Ahmed's mother. Um, and Mustafa was sent back to the old palace where he probably yanked on people's beards and, you know, might have even tugged a dick or two just for fun. Uh, nevertheless, according to Baki Teskan, there's not enough evidence to properly establish that Mustafa was mentally imbalanced when he came to the throne. Mustafa made a number of excur- uh, excursions to the arsenal of the, and the Navy docks, examining various sorts of arms and taking an active interest in the munition supply of the army and the navy. One of the dispatches of Baron de Sensi, the French ambassador, suggested that Mustafa was interested in leading the Safavid campaign himself and was entertaining the idea of wintering in Konya for that purpose. Moreover, one contemporary observer provides an explanation for the coup, which does not mention the incapacity of Mustafa. Baron de Sansi ascribes the deposition as a political conspiracy between the Grand Admiral, Admiral Ali Pasha and Chief Eunuch Mustafa Aga, who were angered by the former's removal from office upon Sultan Mustafa's ascension. They may have circulated rumors of the Sultan's mental instability uh, subsequent to the coup in order to legitimize it, and in doing so, succeeded in getting Osman on the throne. So Mustafa might have not just been crazy. Like I said, he's probably just a little bit weird and into weird shit, which people, you know, took for, oh, he's fucking nuts. In all reality, he just didn't talk to people because he was chained up for so long. Anyways, Osman II was born at Topkapi Palace, Constantinople, uh, Constantinople, the son of Sultan Ahmed I, and one of, uh, and one of his concerts, uh, Mah Firuz Hatun, uh, according to later traditions, at a young age, his mother had paid great, a great deal of attention to Osman's edu- education. As a result of which, Osman II became a known poet which, uh, and was believed to have mastered many languages, including Arabic, Persian, Greek, Latin, and Italian. Which is like, cool, but he wasn't able to like, speak pig Latin, so like, was it really all that cool? I don't know. <laughs> nah, he's pretty dope. Osman was born 11 months after his uh, father Ahmed's transition to the throne. Oh shit, oh, that means Ahmed was like boning right at 13. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, I didn't even think about that till now. Uh, he was trained in the palace. According to foreign observers, he was, he was one of the most cultured of Ottoman princes. Osman was uh, 14 when the coup against Mustafa took place. Despite his youth, Osman II soon sought to assert himself as a a ruler, and after securing the empire's eastern border by signing a peace treaty with Safavid Persia, he personally led the Ottoman campaign against Poland and King Sigismund III during the Moldavian uh, Magnate Wars where he would get his ass handed to him by the Polish. Uh, Forced to sign a humiliating peace treaty uh, with them after the Battle of uh, Chosim in September or October of 1621, Osman II returned home to Constantinople in shame, blaming the cowardice of the Janissaries and the insufficiency of his statesmen for his humiliation. It was their fault, not mine. It was all their fault. But really, it was, that was probably correct, because at this point, the Janissaries had become more interested in politics and would resist military campaigns they deemed unprofitable for themselves or risky. And the one that Osman tried to do was risky as fuck. They would use Osman's lack of representation at home to sway statesmen against the war. The reason why Osman II had no representation was the absence of a female power basis in the harem. From 1620 until Osman's death, since Osman's mother was exiled basically as soon as he took, you know, took over, uh, again, because Qasem didn't want really anyone else to be in power. 
and was and Osmond's mother was also very likely assassinated. Uh, they had a governess uh, appointed as a stand-in valide or mother of the sultan. Um, and the mother of the sultan is in charge of the harem and has great influence in politics, like I said. And she could not counterbalance the contriving of Mustafa's, uh, Mustafa the First's mother in the old palace, who held heavy sway with many in the palace and was slowly trying to regain power. Although Osman did not have a loyal chief eunuch at his side, uh, this could not... Uh, although Osman did have a loyal chief eunuch at his side, this could not compensate for the absence of what in the politics of that period was a winning combination. Uh, the uh, mother of the sultan and the chief eunuch. If you had both of those, you were set. Especially in the case of Osman, who was young and a bit too ambitious. So in the autumn of 1620, Ozzy Bey Iskender Pasha seized the secret letter sent to Transylvanian Prince Bethlen Gabor to Istanbul and sent it to Poland. And Osman also became a veteran of the people around him. He decided to embark on a Polish expedition, continu continuing preparations for the Polish campaign. Uh, neither cold nor famine, uh, nor the English ambassador John Eyre uh, could deter Osman. The ambassador of Sig uh, Sigismund III, the king of Poland, was brought into Istanbul despite the severe colds. The Janissaries and army were not willing to go on a campaign, regardless of their conditions, which made Osman II much more paranoid. As the political climate became unstable as fuck, and so as a precaution, though it does not make clear why, he orders the execution of his 15-year-old half-brother, uh, Sehzad, or Prince Mohammed, by having him hanged, basically reinstating fratricide again, uh, to a much lesser extent, though. Sources are unclear uh, if Mehmed was able to come during his hanging, uh, as more research needs to be done. Following the murder of Sehazad Mehmed on the 12th of January, 1621, a severe snowstorm started in Istanbul, indicating that while Mehmed may not have been able to come, Sky Daddy God certainly did, and oh man, he busted one or two nuts all over Istanbul. The people of Istanbul were drastically affected by the cold, which increased local violence, and on the 24th of January, uh, more so than the palace murder, uh, the, this, they would begin rioting and fighting each other uh, over, <laughs> just like over supplies and like basic needs. Um, this is the biggest natural disaster that will hit the capital in Osman's reign. Uh, and Bostanz, uh, Bostan Zade Yacha Effendi, one of uh, one of those who lived through this cold, tells that the uh, tells that the golden horn in the Bosphorus were covered with ice in the end of January, uh, beginning of February, meaning it was just frozen over for like a solid uh, month, which is fucking nuts. Uh, between Uskudar and Bes uh, Besikitas. The men walk ar around and go to Uskudar. Uh, they came from Istanbul on foot and started a famine, essentially. It was snowing for 15 days. It was so cold that the flakes were frozen from the severity of the cold. But the river was open between Sarabunuru and Uskudar because this natural disaster... Oh, and because of this natural disaster, 30,000 froze between Uskudar and Istanbul from the cold. <laughs> which would cause even more instability in the Sultanate as more pressure and blame would pla be placed upon Osman II. Uh, this was a complete shit show for Osman and began taking notice that the Janissaries had become a little too powerful and influential and learned about talks of conspiracies against him going on in coffee shops, which is just, you know, like, so 1621 behavior, like Barrel Barrel. So, seeking a counterweight to Janissary influence, Osman II closed their coffee shops and started planning to create a new and more loyal army consisting of Anatolian Sekvans. The result, unsurprisingly, was a palace uprising by the Janissaries, who promptly imprisoned the young sultan in Yedikule Fortress in Istanbul. And then Osman II was strangled to death. Um, sources are also unclear if he was able to come or not. My bet is he did. 
Uh, now here's my main complaint about Osman. He fucking knew that these people were out to get him and wasn't more secretive about build, building up his army. Had anyone else less cocky and more cunning been in his shoes, I am sure they would have, one, found ways to appease the Janissary leaders, uh, while two, secretly start infighting within the organization using spies or buying out people. I, I, I don't know. Maybe he did try that and it just wasn't recorded or something, but I think he was cocky enough to think that, you know, shit like him getting strangled to death wouldn't happen to him. So after Osman's death, his ear was cut off and presented to Halime Sultan and Sultan Mustafa I to confirm his death. Mustafa would no longer need to fear his nephew. It was the first time in the Ottoman history that a sultan was executed by the Janissaries, and a case of regicide occurred, in a case that regicide had occurred, and would have an adverse effect for future rulers, as many realized that being sultan did not equal being untouchable anymore. And so many more plots began to brew as Mustafa took the throne again. But Mustafa had a trump card scheming for him. And that was his brother, uh, his mother and brother-in-law, Davud Pasha. Mustafa commenced his second reign by executing all those who had taken any part in the murder of Sultan Osman. More than likely, Pasha and his mother planned this, but Hukha Omer Effendi, the chief of the rebels, the Kizar, uh, uh, Kizlar Aga Suleiman Aga, the Vizier Dali, uh, Dilaver Pasha, and the Kem Makam Ahmed Pasha, the Defeter Baki Pasha, <laughs> and the General of the Janissaries Ali Aga were executed. Uh, because they fucking knew if any of them were left unchecked and they made one wrong move, they were getting choked out and possibly coming from from it next, like Mustafa's siblings did. <laughs> um, I keep referencing that because uh, it's it, it's just insane to me that a third of people who were hung f- fucking got an erection and, and came. Like, <laughs> um, and that cold, hard, sticky fact is now ingrained in my brain. And there's no chance in hell that some stat, that, that same stat did not affect the Ottomans and everyone needs to realize that if you're going to choke a dude out, there is a 33% chance he will get hard and come all over you, okay? Just realize that. So if you're thinking about choking someone out, you're probably going to get cummed on. Anyways, Mustafa's mental condition was unimproved and was still a puppet controlled by his mother and brother-in-law, the Grand Vizier Kara Davud Pasha. He believed that Osman II was still alive and was seen searching for him throughout the palace knocking on doors and crying out to his nephew to relieve him of the burden of sovereignty. <sighs> Which is, that's so fucking sad, actually. Like, it seems like he actually cared about his nephew, at least a little bit. The present emperor, being a fool, was compared unfavorably with his predecessor, when in reality, it was his mother, Halim, uh, Halime Sultan, that was the de facto ruler as Valide Sultan of the Ottoman Empire making most of his choices. And yeah, poor guy just really didn't want to rule. He just wanted to tug beards, feed coins to fish and birds. <laughs> it's, it's really fucking sad, honestly. Um, and he seemed to, again, like at least somewhat care about his nephew, uh, which is really, really rare for um, honestly anyone in the Ottoman family to feel anything towards each other besides fear and animosity. But... Political instability, uh, which was generated by the conflict between the Janissaries and the Sipahis, uh, followed by the Abaza Rebellion, which occurred when the governor general of Izizram, followed by, um, oh, Izizram, Abaza Mehmed Pasha, decided to march on Istanbul to avenge the murder of Osman II. The regime tried to end the conflict by executing Kara Davud Pasha, but Abaza Mohammed continued his advance. Clerics and Kemankes Kara Ali Pasha prevailed upon Mustafa's mother to allow the deposition of her son. She agreed on the condition that Mustafa's life would be spared, and he was able to spend the rest of his days doing what he loved, which was weird, but hey, it made him happy. And uh, only mildly annoyed people uh, whose beards he tugged, or dicks. And so the 11-year-old Murad IV 
son of Ahmed I and Qasim, was enthroned on the 10th of September, 1623. And Mustafa would end up dying um, just, well, I guess 16 years later on January 20th of 1639. Um, it, one source states that he would die of epilepsy, which was caused by being imprisoned for 34 out of 38 years of his life. He's buried in the courtyard of the Hagia Sophia. Well, enough de- about dead people. Let's go ahead and talk about another dead person, uh, Murad IV. Uh, Murad IV was for a long time under the control of his relatives, and during his early years as sultan, his mother, Qasim Sultan, essentially ruled through him. In this period, the Safavid Empire invaded Iraq. Northern Anatolia erupted in revolts, and in 1631, the Janissaries stormed the palace and killed the Grand Vizier, among others. At the age of 16 in 1628, he had his brother-in-law, Kara Mustafa Pasha, executed for a claimed action against the law of God. This was done as he re- was reportedly tied to a corruption network, and Murad was like, nah, I ain't gonna die by any of y'all's bitch-ass hands trying to suffocate me and make me come and shit. Fuck that. <laughs> Or, you know, maybe he said something a little more refined than that. Um, An epidemic which started in the summer of 1625 and called the plague of Bayram Pasha spread to threaten the population of Istanbul. On average, a thousand people died every day. That's right. A fucking thousand people died every day. Uh, That is nuts to think about. I grew up in a small rural rural town, and essentially in one day, the entire population of that town would have been fucking dead. I, <laughs> I cannot imagine that shit going down. It's just, that's too much for me. The people fled to Okmandani to escape the plague. The situation was worse in the countryside of Istanbul. So yeah, my, my small rural ass town uh, would have been fucked had something like that ever happened there. Murad IV was apparently a huge fan of the Puritans' ideals and banned alcohol, tobacco, and coffee in Constantinople, which I'm sure pissed no one off. Uh, He was known to patrol the streets of Constantinople in civilian clothes, enforcing the bans himself. Best part about this is he was a known alcoholic. (laughs) I shit you not. He loved to fucking drink. It was definitely rules for thee, not for me, because he needed to uh, kind of enforce power. Like, these pans were... These bans were part of his larger efforts to curb what he saw as immoral behavior and decadence. Um, And pray to God he didn't catch you breaking this ban, because if you were caught, you were fucking executed. Which, if this shit were applied today, I... (laughs) You know, like, this is kind of how I imagine life would be like if Mormon God was real and went, uh, was back on earth. And you you can bet your sweet ass if he got uh, a whiff of coffee or cigs on you, uh, you're, you're being obliterated into, into space dust. And you know Jay Swizzle Smith would 100% rat your ass out. So you need to be extra sneaky and get Lucy to help you hide any of your shit. So, anyways. Uh, this was a vigorous effort by Murad to, to restore the authority of the Sultanate, which had been eroding in the face of political corruption, military rebellion, and societal decay. As part of these efforts... He implemented a series of strict moral and social reforms, inspired by his understanding of Islamic law and the need for social order. He restored the judicial regulations by very strict punishments, including execution. He once strangled a grand vizier for the reason that the official had beaten his mother-in-law and had to clean up afterwards. Uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah, and he had to clean up afterwards. Uh, sources do not state uh, what it was. He had to clean off himself, but uh, y'all fucking know it was come. That that grand vizier came as uh, he was being strangled. Y- you know it. Many of these reforms would lead to a huge re- uh, resentment of the sultanate, and while it may have temporarily temporarily regiven them power uh, and some sense of security back, it pretty much fucked over whoever would be the ru- next ruler. Also, due to all the issues caused by his predecessors. He was paranoid as fuck, and if he caught any whiff of, well, we could have replaced him with an ex-half-brother, that half-brother would be immediately killed, either by hanging or strangling. He did this until he had only one brother left, Ibrahim. 
uh, who was 20 at the time of the last brother being executed in 1635, and only left him because, one, uh, so far any sons that Murad had had uh, died during infancy. I imagine that they fucking knew what waited for them, and they did not want any part of that shit, and that is why they, they gave up on life, either in the womb or once they got out, because they're like, nah, fuck this, I'm going to go back. <laughs> and then, uh, two, Ibrahim... Ibrahim to him, to Murad, seemed pretty dumb and crazy, as Ibrahim would have random mood swings and talk to himself a lot. Uh, This is probably because Ibrahim has been essentially forced into the cafes or like the golden cell uh, since he's been eight. And uh, that's that's really fucking sad. (laughs) Um, And then number three, at this point, uh, Murad IV still cared about the Ottoman line continuing. So... Now we get into a couple of his wars that he has that will kind of fuck over Ibrahim a little bit. So Murad IV's reign was most notable for the Ottoman Safavid War against Persia, in which Ottoman forces managed to conquer Azerbaijan, uh, occupying Tabriz, Hamadan, and capturing Baghdad in 1638. The Treaty of Zuhab that followed the war generally reconfirmed the borders as agreed by the Peace of uh, Amai. Uh, Amasya, with eastern Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Dagestan staying Persian, western Georgia stayed Ottoman. Mesopotamia was irrevocably lost for the Persians. The borders fixed as a result of the war are more or less the same as the present border line between Iraq and Iran today. Murad IV himself commanded the Ottoman army in the last years of the war, because, you know, he may have talked a lot of game and you know, he at least kind of tried to back back it up, you know. While uh, so while he was encamped in Baghdad, Murad IV is known to have met ambassadors of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, uh, Mir Zarif, and Mir Baraka, who presented 1,000 pieces of finely embroidered cloth and even armor. Murad IV gave them the finest weapons, saddles, and kaftans, and ordered his forces to accompany the Mughals to the port of Bar- uh, Basra where they set sail to the uh, to Thata and finally Surat. Um, in, in addition to the, into all the warring, uh, Murad actually had a little bit of a soft spot. Murad IV wrote many poems. He used the Muradi pen name for his poems. He also liked testing people with riddles. And you better pray to God you were smart enough to answer it correctly. Or, like, you'd get laughed at. Which is like, that's shitty, man. It makes you feel bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, honestly, despite Murad being a brutal authoritarian, he actually did like to play around a bit and wouldn't punish people for getting a riddle incorrect. Um, instead, he once, a, he once wrote a poetic ri- riddle and announced that whoever came with the correct answer would get a generous reward. Sihadi Bey, a poet from Enderon School, gave the correct answer and Murad promoted their status in society and gave them some money. So, you know, it's pretty cool. Uh, Murad would try multiple times to have children and many sons, uh, and had many sons, but all of them would die, as I said earlier, um, super, like, in infancy or super early into their childhood. And uh, due to Murad IV uh, being a hypocrite, uh, he would become sick with cirrhosis. um, And hilarious, it was linked to his heavy drinking uh, that probably caused it. Um, you know, in all reality, his bans honestly were just to assert fear and make it easier for the Sultanate to remain in power. Um, and you know, this kind of makes me wonder what sort of laws our country has passed with similar goals in mind. <coughs> War's on. War on drugs. <coughs> uh, you know, cause, uh, I bet you all of those politicians fucking do a little Coke or a little weed all the time. Uh, but none of them. They, they just wanted to uh, assert power and uh, make us fear them, essentially, or, you know, fear, fear the government a little bit. Anyways, on the February 8th of 1640, Murad li- lay dying, surrounded by court physicians. His mother, Qasem Sultan, Grand Vizier, and some important religious leaders uh, were around him. While consulting with his Grand Vizier, Kamankes uh, Kara Mustafa Pasha, on how the succession will take place, he tells them he will not place the empire into the hands of a madman and orders, uh, orders Ibrahim's death with his dying breath. 
Those in attendance were stunned, to say the least, at this, uh, as it would be the end of the Ottomans. Luckily for Ibrahim, Qasim Sultan would intervene and not allow that to happen. No one's going to hurt her baby boy. Before we get into Ibrahim's rule, uh, let's go over what his life was like a little more, just to have a full context, uh, con- context as to why he goes on to do some of the most depraved and heinous shit you have ever heard of. 